This is Mystic Magic, exploring our spirit to understand our lives. I'm Celeste A. Frazier, your hostess. Today's episode is Mental Expansion. This is the first of our video series, and are we in for a treat? We have the fabulous speaker, writer, poet, songwriter, singer, voice actor, philanthropist, all around good guy, Reverend David Alt, my friend here today. This is Mystic Magic, exploring our spirit to understand our lives. Today's episode is Mental Expansion. Stay tuned. Hi, Mystic Magic podcasters. Uh, it's an exciting day for us today. We are with the amazing, awesome Reverend David Alt today. He's our guest. And um, this particular show about mental expansion is being supported in a most fabulous way. If you've been living under a rock and you do not know who David Alt is, I want to tell you now. Uh -oh. Not only is he on the screen, but here's, here's his info, so take a deep breath. It's good. It's long, but it's a lot. Oh, you can abridge it. Abridge it. <laughs> no, I want them to know the whole thing. For over 30 years, David Alt has been a prophetic voice in the human potential movement as an unwavering crusader for mindfulness, global literacy, and social justice whether through teaching, evolutionary coaching, and keynote presentations. David's singular intention has always been in bridging our collective forgetfulness into our great collective reawakening, right in alignment with what we've been talking about. Mm. As an award-winning author, leadership coach, and education advocate, he loves leading through example, fabulous, and abides by the motto that people would rather see a lesson than hear one. So currently, David is actively touring and coaching associations, business leaders, and individuals on the paramount importance of value-based living and the uncovering of individual and collective hidden themes that hinder optimal living and performance. In Atlanta, he served as a dean to a council of multi-generational, multi-faith leaders who assisted others in dissolving systems, systemic issues of unworthiness, bias, and racism, and building new mental equivalents of equality, character, ethics, spirituality, and wellness. David is the founder of Kaleidoscope Child Foundation, whose mission is to advance vulnerable children and communities worldwide with sustainable education, life skills, and fresh water. Beginning more than 15 years ago, Kaleidoscope now operates schools in Siem Reap, Cambodia, Bog now I may have to be corrected on this, Bodh Gaya and Lakhanpur, oh, yeah. India, yeah. and partners with literacy programs throughout Guatemala, serving more than 1,000 children annually. An adventurer at heart, David has hiked the Inca Trail to the ruins of Machu Picchu in Peru. He's trekked across the entire country of Spain on the ancient pilgrimage known as the Camino de Santiago and summited Kilimanjaro in Africa. He regularly takes groups on sacred site journeys, service trips, and continuously marvels at the wisdom gained through cultural immersion. As a respected teacher, writer, and columnist, David is the author of the bestseller, Where Regret Cannot Find Me, and the multi-award winning, The Grass is Greener, right here. David resides in Atlanta, Georgia. Makes you want to go to Atlanta just to see David. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, I'm tired just listening to all that. <laughs> well, what, what, um, uh, wonderful tenacity and um passion that that speaks to and so yeah you might be tired right in through here <laughs> <laughs> i have had the joy of knowing you for oh my goodness i'm gonna say something like 18 years or something like that 
and um and i am always lifted just by your being your presence and mm-hmm. then um and then wowed by whatever comes from you so it's my joy to have you here thank you so much um, you know we're exploring eternity within ourselves on mystic magic and i understand that you have some resonance with shamanism there's a lot of invisible energy work in shamanism yeah i um... but if, Mm-hmm. I think when people try to define shamanism, that's mm-hmm. uh, it's very open-ended. It's not mm-hmm. a one-size-fits-all. And to me, it's, it's an incredibly pure uh, connection between earth and spirit. And so when you, when you think about all of the fundamentals of that, it goes in many, many different directions. And uh, for me, it is being attracted to and wanting to uncover as much indigenous wisdom as possible and to look at and to try and avail myself or or learn of that sacred connection through the lens of their practices and um and to be open and willing to explore that so it's not everybody's cup of tea uh it's a it's been a very rigorous path um but much of that has been centered around indigenous ceremonial practices. And so uh, this can be a t- taboo topic for some people, but um, I, I leaned into what it meant to explore that through, through plant medicine and through ritual and through medicine people and, um, and just basically out of curiosity. Um, Did it I'm, help you? Oh my God. Um, at some point in a lot of those things, I help might have been an interesting word to use, <laughs> but I, I will say it's, it's, uh, it's deconstruction at its most accelerated. Mm-hmm. And when I say deconstruction, I'm talking about the, um, the advancing of, of dissolving the ego. Uh, there's sort of three rudimentary steps that I have uncovered in, in these lineages. And the first one is always show me what I have become. Mm-hmm. Show me what I have become as a product of all of my themes, my biases, my prejudices, my domestication, my collective victimization, uh, being a product of my culture and, and all of that, show me what it is that I have become and the systems that I hold in sacrosanct. And let me really see if I'm willing to dissolve those, if I can have a different world view. And so without even realizing it, a lot of times we are walking around with a collection of identities. I am this person, I am, and, 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 and many of those things uh, are, are what we navigate the human experience through. You and I, ministers, we are this, we are that. Um, and yet, we're none of those things. Uh, and, and so what is it that we are at our most essential? And in order to get in touch with that, a lot of times you have to look at what you're not. And that's, that can be very sobering, dependent upon how much we're invested in our story. And so show me what, show me what I have become. Uh, it's really a, an affront. It, I laugh sometimes because it, to me, it, it reminded me of what it must have been like to be Ebenezer Scrooge in, in A Christmas Carol when the 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 ghost of what was comes and mm-hmm. takes them back it's very much like that it's like a it's like a travel log of all of the things that you've collected that you hold on to um, that's a good analogy yeah for survival yeah mm-hmm. and then you you know and and it's not a, a one and done thing that's a continuous process because we're very multi-layered right our, our egos Absolutely. are fascinating um, but it's also then morphing into uh, uh, heal my, uh, uh, return me to my soul at all cost. Yes. At all cost. 
you'd be amazed at the caveat piece of that that yeah <laughs> we, we say we want to be returned to our soul but we want it to look this way and and then lastly heal my heart and and i, I will just say one pivotal experience uh out of many um i grew up in a very abusive poor stereotypical household and my mother was widowed when i was seven and uh and and quite quite filled with rage and in behavior and and unskilled uh, is a way to describe it and so there was always this story around her and our relationship and i remember moving into spirituality and thinking oh look at how how evolved i am because i can look at her and i can honor her as my greatest teacher Okay, on the level of intellect, sure, but at the level of heart, um, right. it was still very much ego perspective, and and quite frankly, not my favorite person, uh, and and yet I could rationalize again through the intellect and through spiritual practices that yes, that was the perfect portal to be able to be brought into this existence, but sure. quite frankly, the the woman was certifiable. Mm. And, and so uh, during during a ceremony one time, um, I was taken to my mother's soul. Mm. To the soul. Not not the persona of her as mom, but right. to the soul. And I subscribe to the idea that everyone that we come in contact with we're a, is a part of our soul group. Yeah, yeah, soul contract, right? Soul contracts, and we are playing these parts, and, and I, I love the idea that, that we come in and, and it all gets uh, densed down into a state of forgetfulness, and then we go on the curriculum of remembering and returning mm -hmm. and reawakening to, to all of that, and that's part of that curriculum of, of evolution, and we're assisting one another, right? Yes. And so... And so uh, being taken to her soul, what I witnessed was this agony in her mm -hmm. at agreeing to be the portal for all of my brothers and sisters whose lives did not turn out well. And because of her love for us, there was such a profound hesitancy in, in wanting to, to play that part because the love was so profound mm. and, to be, and to be taken into the energy of that um what did that do to you it just i mean it just reduced me to to just the most um blissful uh mm. state of of love and understanding and compassion and and reframe um and those words don't even begin to describe the experience. I can imagine. I can you know, imagine. And, so, and so we we don't really realize how invested we are in our stories and in our identities. And I think you might have also experienced a whole lot of gratitude too. Well, there was there was a sweet perfection in all of that. You know, uh, uh, like many come from a lot of abuse, and and so. Um, I, I work with a lot of children in, in slums and in villages in, in advanced, uh, rural areas that uh, need desperate support. And so there's lots of trauma, just like there's lots of trauma in everyone. Mm -hmm. and, and yet years ago, what began to happen was, is when they would come and run and hug me or uh, touch my arm or whatever, I would feel this energy. And I, I would begin to sense or, or get visions or, or uh, sensations of their trauma, of their mm -hmm. incest, of, of all of the things. And not that it ever should be normalized, but I realized in such dire poverty areas that that is a normal state of being, is this, this, this constant hum of trauma that these people are, are living in. Right. And how do you work with that? And does it trigger you? Does it trigger something in you? Well, You're it, it, unhealed part. It, start, it was, and, and I could tell that it was affecting me physically, and I could tell that there was so much going on that I 
wasn't skilled at. And that's what spurred my fascination in wanting to, to learn more or to uncover more about what was going on within me because I wanted to be able to do that work. I didn't want to run from that work. I wanted to lean into that work, but to do it uh, in integrity and to do it with skill and to do it with um, understanding and, and at least some semblance of tools to be able to provide. Because you can't just throw things, you can't throw education at someone unless you provide an atmosphere where that education can blossom. A bridge. A bridge, you know. So in the, in the nonprofit world, they, they say you can't care about some of it, you got to care about all of it. And that's a lot. That's a lot when you, when you lean into some level of service like that. So rather than focusing on quantity, you, we all get to focus on quality and how do I bring my best to wherever I'm at. So that's really why I went in that direction so much. Wow. Well, you know, you talked a lot about that inner journey and, um, you know, as New Thought Ministers, we get to um, tap into that ancient wisdom that you were, you were describing um, kind of from an energetic uh, point of view. Um, I think one of uh, Ernest Holmes' favorite um, guides is uh, Plotinus. And he's an ancient mystic that tells us that when the soul looks to God alone for its inspiration, then it can really get the information. Mm -hmm. Well, can you share? I mean, you've been writing books, you've been writing songs, producing CDs, you've been speaking, you've been doing so many different things. Let's talk about your creative process and, and you know, use as many medium as you want mm -hmm. to describe. Because um, for me, it's so it's so magical and yet kind of unexplainable. So maybe you can teach me how to explain what actually happens. <laughs> oh, you're right. I, I will, um, I got to actually write the daily guides for the May edition that's coming out for Science of Mind magazine. And okay. I love that task because I can, I can get a little verbose in my writing and that makes me have to condense it down Yes. To a fine oath, like, woof, and uh, such a great exercise. But one of the uh, daily guides I, I think I, I did for May was about acknowledging one of my first teachers in this movement. And she said uh, to us, whatever gets you through the night. Mm -hmm. She said, whatever, whatever tool, whatever pathway resonates for you, whatever it is that gets you through the night, go to that, lean to yeah. that, use that, explore yeah. that. Don't, don't become so sequestered or siphoned off or myopic in one thing. Allow yourself to be uh, multiversed so that you can glean from it all and then find what works for you. And so I appreciated that. And, uh, Which teacher I'm, I'm, was that? That was Maureen Hoyt. Okay. And out of Los Angeles, the Los Angeles yeah. area. Yeah, I many love years. Maureen. And yeah. she, she used to tell us, whatever gets you through the night. And, and uh, that really stuck with me because it, it gave me like a personal breath of permission. Um, to not limit yourself. Right. Mm -hmm. um, that, that yes, there is absolutism if you will but that absolutism absolutism really speaks to the one idea which is god is all yeah but however it is that you arrive at that absolutism that's your that's your sandbox to play in mm. so my my spiritual practice then uh really centers around beginner's mind yeah um how do I approach everything with the beginner's mind? How do I, how do I check my, I know that already at the door? That's how, pretty brave. Yeah. Uh, and admittedly, I will say before most talks, um, hey, uh, whatever's coming through, 
uh, keep what works for you and, <laughs> and discard the rest. Um, one, one thing to, to take note of is if there is something that rubs you the wrong way, consider that maybe that is the thing that is wanting to speak to you, but, but by no means look at me as the sage on the stage that knows everything. I'm, I'm in this with you. And so, um, I yeah, because a lot, yeah, a lot of times, um, you know, what's, what, what spirit has to say is, is deeper than what I could think of. <laughs> right. So a lot of that is like, um, uh, in Zen Buddhism, there's, there's a, a path called Shoshin, which is about <laughs> beginner's mind or awareness. And, uh, Ram Das, who I just love, um, yes. he would, he would, he would say to uh, lie on your back and stare up at the sky and practice Soshan, which meant that the sky is awareness. So the sky in and of itself is boundless. There's no way that you and I can ever define it, uh, explore it all. It's, that's awareness. Anything that enters into the field of awareness then is our phenomena or yes. our our interpretation or our identification. So when the cloud comes or the bird comes or the airplane comes, those things are our, I'm, I'm hungry, I'm in pain, uh, I'm afraid. Those, those things are that enter into or pass in a transient state through the field of awareness. And instead of making them wrong or trying to fix them, if I could just look at them, and right. observe them without judgment or attachment, um, but continue to turn back to the field of awareness and, and identify the fact that really what I am is loving awareness. Everything that else is passing through, what somebody did to me, what didn't happen, my disappointments, all of that kind of stuff, those are just things that are passing through that field that they have no bearing whatsoever on who I am or what I am, because I'm just loving awareness. Yeah, I got a sense of um, the the sky being kind of a, a map or a compass, um, particularly when I was listening to a gentleman who was presenting at the Centers for Spiritual Living conference this year. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's the kind of map that we can read that'll say turn left here or go 100 miles there, but that it is perhaps information for our soul. Yeah. And that it's reading that, you know, it's getting the code, embodying that, embedding that, and that we just go from there and trust that we have what we need, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, for me, it's like, I love going, I don't, I think I know something, but maybe I don't know anything. So how do I go right. in with pure state of acceptance? And um, that's you mentioned, kind of Mm -hmm. The one thing that's, that seems to be the one thing <laughs> that has, has been the most fruitful. Yeah, you mentioned that um, there was times when people might feel uncomfortable with things that you might say that that might be what they came to hear. And that's that, that growing edge that is pretty uncomfortable. And when you get uncomfortable, that should be our clue for, wow, let me look at this a little deeper. Sure. So, you know, um, we, we get to allow ourselves to be inlets, as um, Ern, Ern Emerson would say. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Emerson being one of the premier um, leaders in the New Thought movement, he said that we become outlets to the divine nature so you are quite the outlet with the work that you do with the Kaleidoscope Child Foundation. The many ways that you support social justice and LGBTQIA rights and the spiritual writing that you do and the spiritual music that you produce. So would you share with us um, more about what you do in the world other than what I've been sharing from your bio? Um, perhaps in a more personal way? Um, Kaleidoscope Child Foundation was born out of a vow. 
and so um, I I was in Cambodia in 2004, and the reason that I was there, and that was my first time, was because um, I had a fairly decent sized mailing list, and people would say, hey, do you want to lead a tour to this sacred site? And I'd go, sure, because that was my way to see the world. Uh, and without plan, uh, at least on my part, when I arrived at Cambodia, there was this just undeniable um, familiarity and presence and energy. And for many people that were on that trip, it was the first time that they were smack dab looking at the face of poverty, um, where the delineation between the haves and the have nots was so pronounced. Uh, Remarkably, it has really changed in Cambodia, not in India, but in Cambodia uh, over the years because of tourism. And so thing, the landscape has changed. But at that time, uh, things were still very, very dire and in your face. They've sort of moved the dire back further into the villages. But, um, and so there's a natural empathy that rises up in people. And the group wanted to do something. And I, I knew that in such uh, situations that there's very little sustainability that can be established. And yet, uh, I, I did want to honor them and even honor what I was feeling and, and to explore what this familiarity was with these people. And so I went to the guide and I said, take us to the worst place. Mm. Take us to the worst situation that you know. And yes, I understand that this is a one-off, that these people will be gone in a few days. And I said, we might as well maximize this effort. So if we're going to maximize this effort, then take us to something that is seemingly impossible so that we can at least, even if it's temporary, make a dent. And so if it's, if it's to feed one belly, then let's go feed that one belly. Um, and so that's kind of what happened was he took us to the banks of the Tonle Sap Lake, which during the dry season is where all of the refugees and the landmine victims, the people whose legs had been blown off from the Cambodian Civil War, uh, the poorest of the poor, the displaced, and all these children that, that were just roaming around like animals, basically, because they were, they, they themselves were displaced or were, they were traveling almost like herds of gypsies. And so they would build these tenement villages on the bank of the lake until the monsoon started again, and then they would scatter. And he said, if you really want to see the worst of the worst, that's where it's at. And he says, and you can't just show up there. You have to, we ha we, you would have to plan this out. You would have to bring foods that would be indigenous to even what it is that they're used to eating. And the only way that you could do that was if you went to a local market. And it started to seem overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And yet just kept leaning into it and finally what ended up happening everyone was in agreement he took us to um to a local market we ended up taking everything from three of them and when i went to pay for it it was 86 dollars mm. 86 dollars and i just had this epiphany you know that um anybody can do anything right where they are and no it doesn't have to be on a grand scale and no it doesn't have to be across the world but there are pockets of opportunity that present themselves all the time yeah if we're paying attention so i took that as an as a pocket or a moment of time that was saying you know what david maybe maybe this is something that you can do and I had read, there's a, a writer by the name of Doug Boyd, and I'll never forget, he said, uh, the, the most effective mantra that you can ever say is, I'm available. 
Mm. And then he said, and look out, because if you mean it, yeah. your whole world will change. Yeah. And it reminded me of A Course in Miracles, where it mm. says love brings up everything unlike itself. Yes. Yes. So if you say I'm available, or if you <laughs> then then look out because everything to say that you're not qualified will rise up. If you say I'm an advocate for love, then everything unlike love rises up in order to not not to test or make us wrong, but to see if we're gonna be in integrity with our advocacy. Yeah, and, I and can't, grow it. And yeah, and 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 Celeste, I can't tell you how many mistakes I made. Oh my God, it was just awful and embarrassing in those beginning stages of thinking that people are just gonna bend over backwards to help and they didn't. And, mm -hmm. and I had to talk about, show me what I have become. I had to look at my white savior complex mm -hmm. that I didn't even know I had. I had to look at that component of look at how only because I my ego was telling me that I wasn't enough. So rather than me working on me, sure. I was going to use them as a way to say, no, I'm fine. That's a disaster. Yeah. Good for you for having that insight. Yeah. And you what you start to learn is, you know, you work with people, not for them. Right. You have to work with people. And I've had so many teachers None of them in, in the States, they've all been a Guatemalan woman, an Indian man, somebody in <laughs> Cambodia who have taught me that you work with people, not for them. Yes. Beautiful. Well, I know that you want people to know about perhaps they, how they can contribute to the uh, Kaleidoscope Child Foundation. Mm -hmm. um, we'll have that link available in our show notes as well as um, davidalt.com and I'm sure all your books will be in there and maybe even some of your music and your poetry and your videos um, I would love for people to be able to experience you there's so much breadth and depth to you I'm just so grateful that you, you said yes to come and be with us today sure yeah. I love you. I can't love wait you. to hear more about the work that you do. And I'm grateful. Thank you, Celeste. Thank you for doing this and providing this forum. Yes, my pleasure. Yeah. All right. This is Mystic Magic, exploring our spirits to understand our lives. The great connector of life, the ever-present essence that life is. I think your thoughts, I share my fear, and you are there answering in the form of ancestor, in the form of truth, in the form of abundance. You shift my focus from darkness to light, from inside to outside from single to all, for infinity. That's my poem, Infinity. You can find it on amazon.com and my book, In Spirit, In Love. Thank you for tuning in today. My name is Celeste A. Frazier, and this is Mystic Magic. We'll be back next Wednesday at 1230 Pacific Time when the topic is Mother Earth. And the guest will be the phenomenal Dr. Will Coleman. Reach out to me at buzzsprout.com. Leave a review. For more podcasts, please subscribe. And you can even support the show. You can also find me at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, and at many other podcast venues. Check out the show notes at mystic.magic.buzzsprout.com. There's some jewels there for you. This is Mystic Magic, exploring our spirit to understand our lives. <laughs>